This morning we're going to talk uh, about timeless truths. Thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, building our hopes on things eternal. If you grew up in the church, you probably remember uh, the great hymn, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. Uh, still a favorite of mine, but uh, it begins, time is filled with what? Remember the song? Time is filled with swift transition. See, we all remember it. Uh, not of earth can bring, and then it goes on uh, in the chorus, hold, hold to God's unchanging hand. Where the song points people to the fact that life is ever-changing, and it's always changing. Technology changes, people change, they come in and out of our lives. Our lives change, we enter jobs, we leave jobs, we move to new places, we stay for a while, then we move to other places. Uh, death happens, birth happens. Life is always filled with change. For, so for God's people, it becomes always important to build our hope on things that do not change. And as the great hymn described, build our hopes on things that are eternal. Jesus indicated this is what we ought to do in the end of the Sermon on the Mount. I want to begin by reading uh, from Matthew chapter 7. If you have your Bible with you or you have a scripture on your phone. Look what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the what? On the rock. Exactly as you see pictured on the screen. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on what? Sand. The rains came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. So here Jesus says, if you follow these teachings of mine, you're putting your, the, your life, which is the house here, on rock. The winds can come, the rain can come, the storms can rise, but your house will stay solid because you're building your life on eternal truths. That's what Jesus is saying. What he is teaching is an eternal truth. That means it's timeless. It can withstand the storm of life and life changes and life temptations and uncertainties. His truth is solid and timeless. But if you build just on trends, you build on what's popular or what seems to be what people are all wrapped up in at the time, it's like building on sand. Uh, I've lived for a while in Florida. I have family that lives in Florida. Uh, I'm always amazed because when hurricane season comes in, those outer areas, which are always nice to live, and I'm not saying you can't live there, but you better have hurricane insurance because you're going to be building, I can tell Jonathan, those are, you'll be building on sand. And sand is not a good foundation, and those homes are always the first to go, always the, out there on the outer islands, as they call them, the most beautiful place to build a home, but the most dangerous place to build a home because it Sand and building there cannot withstand storms. So we want to build our hopes on things that are eternal, things that last, things that are timeless. And we're going to look at six over the last, or over the next, I'm sorry, three weeks. We're going to look at two today, two next week, and then two the following week. These are things that you can build your life on. Timeless truths that are anchor points for you as a believer. And at the beginning of a new year, it's always good to remind ourselves of these things. Here's the first. God controls the world you see. God controls the world you see. Go ahead and turn forward in your New Testaments to the book of Hebrews. Chapter 1, we're going to look at the first five verses. The book of Hebrews was written to Christians from a Jewish background. And sometimes people that are Jewish are also called Hebrews. That was the earliest name for God's people that were the descendants of Abraham. They were called simply the Hebrews. 
Uh, if you look in the book of Exodus, during the time of the deliverance, they were called the Hebrews. And the earliest Christians were from a Jewish background. But these early Christians also were the first to experience persecution for their faith. And they'd taken a big step to put their allegiance with Christ. And some of the earliest persecution came not from the Roman government, but from their fellow Jewish people who had not accepted Jesus as the Messiah. They saw these Jewish people that did accept the Messiah as traitors, betrayer of the law of Moses, and they literally tried to ostracize them from the Jewish community. And early Jewish believers experienced great upheaval in their lives. Very little was certain. They were persecuted, they lost their jobs, they lost where they could live, they were threatened with death. Just as we see in the early book of Acts, uh, persecution arose from the Jewish people against believers. And the temptation of many Jewish believers was to go back to the old ways. To go back to the Old Testament, the law of Moses, the certainty of the sacrificial system, the temple worship, things that were considered legal and acceptable and positive among the Jewish community. They were tempted to go back to that, but those are things that God had left. He had moved on to go to His Son and provide salvation for the world through His Son. And the book of Hebrews was written to get people to hold fast to what they believed. So timeless truths are given throughout this book, and we're going to look at two within the book, and this is the first. God controls the world you see. Let's see the first thing the writer of Hebrews said, it's most likely the Apostle Paul, the first thing the writer of Hebrews said to these believers who are on the edge, tempted to go back to what is safe and comfortable within their culture. Verse 1. Chapter 1, book of Hebrews. The writer says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, and through whom also, he made the universe. <clears throat> Verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Sustaining, remember that word, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Verse 4, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. The first thing the writer of Hebrews wanted to tell these Christians who are being shaken and having the foundation of their lives, their certain things turned upside down, he wanted to tell them about God and God's Son. He first told them God spoke in various ways through the prophets in the past, but in these last days, which is our days too, in these last days He's spoken to us by the Son, but He wants to tell us something about the Son of God. He says, whom He appointed, verse 2, heir of all things, through whom He also made the universe. <clears throat> when we look at Scripture about creation, we know from Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the world. But God is a triune being. That is, there's three persons that make up God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And here we find that God the Son had a key part, a leading role, if you will, in the creation of our world. It says, through whom He also made the universe. That is, the Father made the universe through His Son. But look what His Son also does in verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. And then this word, sustaining. Sustaining all things by His powerful Word. Here we find the Son of God is not only creator of the world, that is all that we see around us, is a product of His creative power, but He's also sustaining the world. That means it's keep, he's keeping it in order. 
That is, God has control over the world. Scripture does not entertain the idea that God just created the world and then He left it alone. <laughs> In multiple places, Scripture indicates that God is also sustaining this world by His mighty hand, by His power. And whether that refers to the laws of the universe that keeps the planets in perfect alignment with the sun and maintains our seasons of fall, summer, winter, spring, or simply maintaining our atmosphere, even though at times we think we're in control, God is really the one in control. Not only of this world that we see, but of the interactions within the world. That's what's being told to us. And it's told to us in many places, many times in Paul's sermons, the book of Acts, chapter 17. He would speak about a God not that just created, but a God that sustains and is actively involved in his world. Which means he's also actively involved in your life. Because you are part of his world. And that's what these Hebrew Christians are being told right off the bat. That God is sustaining your life. So even though you're being threatened, you're being persecuted, things don't seem like they're going right, He is sustaining your life. Let's look at one of these instances. Go back to Acts chapter 17. I want to look at just another place where the apostles are making the point that God is actively involved in their lives. And in a very personal way. Acts chapter 17, verse 24. Uh, this is a sermon of the Apostle Paul in Athens, you know, the center of ancient Greece. They had an idea that there's a multiplicity of gods, but notice what Paul says. Verse 24, Acts 17. The God who made the world and everything in it is a Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Let's just pause there. Let me reread that. This is what God is currently doing. Rather, he himself gives, that is present tense, gives everyone life and breath and everything else. That means he's involved in our life. Verse 26, from one man he made the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. He marked out their appointed times in history, and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. <clears throat> Verse 28, for in him, we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Let me reread that last verse, verse 28. For in him, that is God, we live and move and have our being. Here's what this is telling us about our God is a timeless truth that God controls the world you see. We might say, well, why is this important to know, John? Well, if you watch the news, which I'm doing less and less of, my life is improving every hour because of that, um, everything appears out of control. Everything appears out of control. And if you're constantly digesting today's media, you will have the sense that everything's just falling apart. And everything's out of control. Clearly there are things that are wrong and things that are happening. People are doing things against another person that is wrong. That's, we're not in denial about that. But the media and the mindset of many people is that things are out of control. As we walk into another political year, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse as far as the perception of things being out of control. But here Paul is telling us that no, God is in control. That doesn't mean he's making things all turn out the way they should. And that is very clear in Scripture. Even though we have a God who's in control, that doesn't mean he's making us all robotically do the right thing, because clearly everyone's not doing the right thing. But in Scripture we find out either God will send things 
into the lives of people to change them, or God will allow things to happen for His purposes. God either sends things as an intervention, and that's why we pray. We pray for God's intervention in health concerns or personal conflict. We pray that God will do, sing, do things to change things. <clears throat> but also God will allow certain things. That's why sometimes when we pray for healing or recovery or a correction of a problem, we don't see it change. Sometimes not at all, or at least not within the time frame we want. People do not get better that we prayed would get better. Sometimes situations of conflict between ourselves and others go on much longer than we prayed months earlier. That Please, Lord, fix this now. We don't have a biblical answer for why God doesn't instantly answer all prayers. But we know from Scripture that God is in control by either sending things or allowing things. Some things are simply allowed because He gives us free will. He gives us the ability to choose right from wrong, but also experience the consequences of right and wrong. And that's what we do see on the news. God's free will is people go the opposite direction than what He wanted and the consequences of those decisions. But never think for a moment that your life is out of control or this universe is out of control and there's things that God doesn't know about. Oh, don't ever think for a moment there's things that God cannot intervene and stop. He could stop them if He so choose, or chooses to stop them. Again, we don't know always why He will or why He will not. We don't know why car crashes at times result in death. We wonder why did not God intervene to stop the death of that person. But yet, in another crash a day earlier when no one is hurt, we'll say, wow, that must be God. And... Uh, we can't interpret life that way. We're not to be interpreters of when God did something and when He didn't do something. We're simply to pray, trust and obey as the song goes, and trust that God knows what He's doing, even in what He allows. It's all a part of His control. I'm in control of my classroom at school. But certain times I'll let certain students do certain things that other students don't get to do. I have a lot of students that have severe emotional challenges. And I can tell by their eyes when they walk into the door that they're not in a good place and they have severe family problems and challenges that are deep within them and their own emotions and things they deal with at home. And even though they're supposed to come and sit at their desk <laughs> and start taking notes right away when I recognize they're not in a good place, I say, Mr. Mulligan, can I, can I just go to your office and sit? I'll say, okay, go ahead. I say, Mr. Mulligan, can I not take notes today? Can I just put my head down? And I'll say, okay. Just because they're not doing maybe what I'd rather them do, that is take notes on World War II today, I recognize what's right in the moment, though I'm in control, is to allow them to do what they want to do or need to do at the moment. So being in control doesn't mean you make someone always do what they should do or what you want them to do. Sometimes you allow things to happen because you see there's something that's needed. So as we deal with our world, <coughs> understand that God controls the world that you see. Even the bad that you see, He's allowing it. Or the good, He may well be intervening to bring that good. Or simply, people are doing the right thing by His will, and that is good. But do not think for a world that He is, or for a moment that He is not in control. That's the first timeless truth: God controls the world you see. Here's the second, and walks you through it all. God controls the world you see, and walks you through it all. Look forward now to the book of Hebrews. We started with Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. I want to see in our closing thoughts this morning about the blessing of God's control and how that He's not controlling from a distance. 
It's not like he's way off in the universe somewhere with a, a board full of levers and switches and, and very distantly engaged in doing things in this world or not doing things. He's with us in every moment. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. The writer says, Keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can human beings do to me? Let's first look at verse 5. He says, keep your lives free from the love of money. Let's just pause here. Scripture does not say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the problem. Paul addressed this in 1 Timothy. He addresses it again here in Hebrews. He says, keep your lives free from the love of money. Many people love money because money is control to them. Money is power. The bank account is full or the investments are full or the credit cards have high limits, that's power and control. To do whatever you want or to be free from uh, poorness or free from not being able to acquire what you wish to acquire or to have what others have. He says, keep your life free of that mentality. Don't think that you have to have your bank accounts or investment accounts full or you have to have possessions and things like that or that are acquired by money. He says, Keep your lives free from that and be content with what you have. Learn to be okay with not as much. Learn to be okay with a little. Paul said in Philippians 4, I've learned what it is to abound, and I know what it means to uh, be in need. But he said, I've learned to be content. He didn't say happy. <coughs> he didn't say, I love being poor, or I love having nothing in the bank. He never said that. But he learned to be content. Be content with what you have, because you, you are really rich even when you have nothing. Look what he says at the end of verse 5. For God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The beauty of God being in control of our world is that even in the ebb and flow of life, whether one is a college student with nothing, or someone goes through a rough financial period where they lose their job and there's a long time before the new job appears. Or someone enters into retirement with far less than what they hoped they would have. And there's a lot of uncertainty. God says, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Well, what's that saying about the presence of God? It's saying he's right there with you. Not way off somewhere in the heavens, but He is right there with you, walking you through it all. Amen. And this is a profound, timeless truth for our life. Because we live in a culture now where many people feel very alone. We're connected electronically through our devices, but loneliness and a sense of People not caring is at an all-time high because we've kind of disengaged with people a lot on a personal level and just are connecting electronically. We can't reverse time and get rid of all of our devices, but it's just kind of the reality of our world. But here, one thing that has never changed is the presence of God. If someone is walking with God and they're obedient to Him, God is always right there with them. God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. But even if someone is in rebellion to God, it's not like God has totally turned his back and he's not even looking at them anymore. He's like the father of the prodigal son. He's always there waiting for the prodigal or the delinquent or the rebellious child to come home. Remember in the parable of the prodigal son, the son is the one that left the house to go live this wild life. But the son knew he could come back to the father, and he did. The father never left him. 
So in this very real way, we are never alone, and God walks us through it all. And I want to end these thoughts with two psalms. Turn back to the book of Psalms that indicate exactly how close God is. First psalm is Psalm 139, and then we'll look at an even more familiar one, Psalm 23. Psalm 139, both written by David. There's more chapters of the Bible that reference David than any other outside of Jesus. And look what David says about his understanding of the closeness of God in his life. Verse 1, Psalm 139. He says, You have searched me, Lord, and know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. Verse 3. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Verse 11. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Verse 17, How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. What is David praising here? Is he praising a distant God that doesn't know what's going on in his life and has no idea? You ever met someone that really hasn't been keeping up with you? Oh, I didn't know you were back. Oh, I didn't know you had moved. I didn't know you had another child. A lot of times our knowledge is incomplete because we're not keeping up as much as we would like or as much as maybe we should. But here we have a God who's with us every moment. David says, where can I go from your spirit? Verse 7, where can I flee from your presence? There's never a moment in your life where your God is not with you. Aware of your circumstances, aware even of your own thoughts. You might live alone, but you're not alone. And here David embraces this presence of God. He says, how precious to me are your thoughts, God, that you're with me basically all the time. And think how powerful that is. That sometimes people will come come into our lives and they will leave our lives. Children will grow up in our household, but then they'll leave, and our time will be very little with them in the future. Spouses will come and go. Close friends that we've lived with. Neighbors down the street. People that we've trusted to always be there will not always be there. Family members pass away. Again, the hymn says, time is filled with 
swift transition. We are in a world of constant change, but the one unchangeable is God's presence. He walks us through, the wall, through it all. Psalm 23, I'll bear our last text. This very familiar psalm describes again God's closeness as he walks through our world with us. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. <clears throat> you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, uh, surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's no accident why this is one of the most familiar sections of Scripture. Because it describes God's closeness, His presence. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Again, you might be alone in the absence of another person, but we are never truly alone. Because our God is with us at all times. He's with you on your best days, and He's with you on your worst days. He will never leave you or forsake you. So God is in control of the world you see, but He walks you through it all. From your days of infancy to the days of your death, your God will be with you. Is there anyone else that will, can say that? Even the ones that love you the closest in this life cannot say, I will always be there with you because they cannot control their own life. And how long they will live, though their desire is to be with you all the time, but your God will be there. From cradle to coffin. Whom else can we find that in? A timeless truth. And God walks you through it all. So as we leave this morning, if you found that this season has been a time of loneliness or a time of painful reflection upon people that maybe are not there that used to be there or things not as certain or things as reliable as they used to be or maybe there's trepidation about the future and what, what will happen in this next year, just know that God will never leave you or forsake you. There's never been a moment he hasn't been with you and he's not going to give up on you now. He might not tell you everything that's going to happen and how it's all going to work out. But he is right there with you, walking you through it all. You'll get through. Just stay close to him and he will be there. We can sing a song in just a moment to encourage us to stay faithful because this is our challenge to be faithful with an invisible God who we cannot see as we can see the person sitting next to us. But he's given us evidence throughout this world that he is there. And may we cling closely to the truths that affirm his presence. May we believe with all our heart that he's truly in control of our lives. And may we put our faith in his son, who is a source of all life. And today, if you need to seek forgiveness or seek his presence by bringing your life to him, if you feel like you're separated like the prodigal son, you can always come back. God is looking to come back to you you and waiting for you to come back to him. Let the words of this song provoke you to take whatever step you need to take to bring your life in harmony with God. Let's stand and sing this song together.